Cochineal insect, uh, for me, has been extremely important to be able to revitalize and understand about not only the technicality of creating colors using cochineal insect, but also what it represents to us as indigenous per, per person, um, the historic memory, memory of the color itself, but also of the insect. The color red has been a significant symbolism within our culture. Historically, the color red has been used in burials, uh, has an association with the sun, God, and also uh, with blood. Cochineal, specifically, historically, was used as medicine. When there's a wound, uh, the cochineal is uh, pulverized or it's being ground and pour the part that, it's, that was wound. Also, the doctors will refer it for, um, or prescribe it for different heart issues. But the color red itself in a culture understanding has always communicated something much more deeper than just the color itself. As you see on the screen, uh, there is a procession, a ceremony procession that happens within our community where women wears these uh, enredos or more of a skirt like, that they all have to be red. And of course, here's also uh, the syncretism I was talking about. Now where the Catholicism, uh, understanding that you could see within our community through the images in, 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 the, uh, in their heads. So if you were ever to ask one of the villagers, well, what the color, color red means to you, we might not be able to explain to you the exact meaning of them, but one thing we know that it has a spiritual and, and uh, sacredness to the color itself, and it continues to be seen through our ceremonies. The women you see right in the center, that's my mother, continue to wear her traditional dress and helping the young or next generation to teach them how to use their, uh, their ceremonial dressing. That specifically has obviously um, has been an inspiration for me as an artisan, or as a dyer, but also as a uh, more conceptual artist, is uh, to be able to understand not only um, how cochineal insect was used, but also what cochineal insect, and the role that cochineal insect played through the colonial period when the Spanish arrived, they didn't find gold, but they did later on found cochineal insect. And I'm sure many of you have read um, the significance or what color red represented to Europeans at that time. It's the, the, the status and, and the, um, uh, the upscale representation of people that were wear reds or purple. So therefore, there was such a big exploitation of uh, production of cochineal insect that's going into Europe. There's been, at one point, there was at least 10 tons or even more uh, ships that were traveling from Mexico going into Spain carrying cochineal insect. So when I think about movement of, of something, when I think about movement in diaspora, cochineal insect is one of the most uh, thing that I could pinpoint within the arts. Of course, prior to that, indigenous people have always been moving throughout the Americas. And uh, that's how some of these, some of my work, so what you see on your screen here, it is a series of work that I call diaspora um, it communicates this movement and the need of movement of people. Um, the design you see, it's the traditional design, it's called butterflies. Uh, the, the, what I was looking for here is to be able to create this, this movement. So I wove a white canvas wool, and then it was then dyed, and then it was needle felting designs on them. So evolving and moving forward, um, as, as traditional artisans, but also engaging other ways of, of trying to communicate a, a concept. And specifically, I uh, involve the uh, butterflies because um, if I think about monarch butterflies and the movement of people and the need, so it takes around four to three, uh, three to four generations for the monarch butterflies from Canada spend the first winter in Mexico and be able to come back northern United States and up into Canada. There's always this need of going back home, but in order for them to save their species, they have to move and be able to, to uh, and come back. 
for them, there isn't any border, there isn't anything that stops them from migrating and save their species. It is the same exact principles when I think about indigenous people. How over thousands of years we have been migrating and moving throughout for to save our species or uh, our, to have better opportunities. And uh, throughout this understanding, uh, creating other work that not only communicate aesthetic symbolism uh, coming from the tradition, but also um, welcoming new, new ways of expressing. So this is a series of work that is called Fragments, that it's drawn by the uh, Santillo style sarapes. The Santillo style sarapes, um, up until now, historians have not been able to trace it back to where the origination of this particular style of weaving, but we know that it started by the Spanish when they arrived and the master indigenous people of Mexico. But the design itself, as you can see, there's some influence of Moorish or Middle Eastern style of rod, but you know, coming from Spain out down into Mexico. For me, obviously, that also has been uh, an important inspiration for me, but also it's a way of honoring, paying homage to an indigenous people that has also played an important role in uh, creating this type of style of work. And uh, colors has obviously, is the first thing that we think about when we think about it in an art piece. For me, color is secondary, although it has such an important symbolic element within our culture. And I say it's secondary because color starts from nature. My artist material, it lives within nature. So if you think, if you ask me what will be the first step to start one weaving, I will say that we would have to wait for the rain to fall so the plants could grow and so then you and I could then go and harvest the material we need. And as we are harvesting the material, what we're doing at that point, we are actually harvesting a memory or a DNA of nature that it only represents time in history that it was collected. And that it also communicates the outcome of the color. The color is going to behave differently every season depending on the amount of water it received. If it was a drought, whether the plant grows or it's growing on one side of the mountain where it does not receive enough shade or receive too much sun. From there, then you're also now dealing with uh, the water that you're using. Whether it's a hard water or it's a soft water. And it's going to also dictate the outcome of the color. So throughout my weavings, what you see and the colors that you see on the designs, um, those are, the, that's what? The vocabulary of nature. Me as human, I can only transform them and as humans, we tend to transform it into perfection. And that could definitely be done matching color. But beyond that, it's just recognizing that what I'm working with, it is something alive. So as an artist, I then recollect this information and technicality of creating one piece and be able to create work that not only speaks to aesthetic design, but also it communicates and creates a dialogue around indigenous issue and things that I have been able, me as an uh, as individual, have experienced. Two years ago, I opened up my studio in California, where I have been living for the last 26 years. And a few people has asked me, I would like to buy one of your pieces, but does it still hold the rich culture as it did in Oaxaca? Does it continue to hold this um, family tradition since now you're in LA, you're not as traditional as you would hope for. So society uh, sees indigenous people and wants to package indigenous people in a way that we're not expect them uh, to communicate in a much more conceptual or modern. We not expect them to uh, look, or we only expect them to look a certain way, speak certain things, and um, so we forget that tradition is not defined by the borders. So the piece you see here on your screen, uh, it's called the series of work that I call Continuous Line. For those of you, and I know a lot of you here that are artists, so I, um, the reference of Continuous Line within the arts, it is creating a, a drawing with not having to lift your pencil until the drawing is complete. 
So when I think about myself, it doesn't make me any less or more that living in Oaxaca and now living in Southern California. I am home. I am in the Americas. I'm not in a different country in my mind. And uh, our head is our house. Tradition flows through the people. The people carries the tradition and it evolves and enriches and it communicates in a such a modernism way because that's how indigenous people are engaging in today's environment. When I think about obviously how my work could continue to create this dialogue, it is so important for me especially to be able to create this uh, understanding around the materials because uh, for me it is having that understanding of what I'm working is it's a life. And it, can, it cannot be forced, it cannot be fast in making. So each piece, it will take around for maybe two by three piece, it will take nearly 400 hours to make. I cannot speed that up, I cannot make it faster. Instead, I think of it as hopefully something that not only represents an imprint of a particular season, but something maybe if it's used for my more functional work, that it could be used as a floor rug it could serve a family or a home for the next generation or three. So when I think about my tradition and how, where I could um, go for information, it's around us, it's around me. The image you see, it's a, an image of part of a building that's called Mitla. This is one of the most important ceremonial sites for the Zapotec people and the design you see on the walls has been an important inspiration for our culture for many many generations and continue to be my inspiration as well. Cochineal insect it is a scale insect that breeds on prickly pear cactus. It takes about 60 to 70 thousand insects to make one pound of dye stuff. It takes about 1,000 to 1,200 leaves of prickly pear cactus to make two pounds of dye stuff. My ancestor, as I mentioned earlier, has been engaging with the use of cochineal insect and they were probably the or one of the cultures that helped to domesticate a wild insect and what the modern science know them as today as Dr. Lopez Cocos E120 or, or carminic acid. As soon as you start to grind the insects, you immediately start to see these carmine in beautiful deep red. I understand that cochineal insect in its natural form, it is a base form. And as soon as you start to shift the pH into a more, more a much more acid environment or a alkalinity environment, you start to expand the vocabulary of color into oranges and reds, pinks and so forth. But there's also over dyes. If you're a painter, you mix. If you're a dyer, about 95% of the time you're layering colors meaning you have first dye one color and then dye a second color. In fact, a lot of the deep reds you see on my pieces, there's a layer of yellow underneath in order to obtain a specific color shade of red. As I mentioned earlier, how much the environment, the influence environment has the outcome of the color the second thing would be water, and the third thing would be the vats that you're using to dye the, the yarns in this case, whether it is a stainless steel, it is an iron pot, uh, that it's all going to help to either expand the color or to continue to modify the element in order to obtain the colors you're looking for. Today, within my community, to give an example, there's only about 5%, there's probably max 12, 15 weavers within my community that continues to honor and try to also revitalize and preserve the natural dye tradition. When our tradition was standardized, these technicality uh, using natural dye was depleted. So we focus on catering tourism. We're focusing on wholesalers that are trying to preserve or that are trying to mass produce and make something cheap. And so in many ways within our rich tradition, we became a factory. I grew up as a laborer of this market, of this, uh, yeah, at this market. 
So what I'm trying to do as an artist, I'm trying to regain my right to imagine and to dream and to be able to be creative as an indigenous person. Thank you. This is your time. Sits on Namiyak, 
Uh, so what is that that we bring um, as an organization and how can we as an institution uh, honor those uh, some um, uh, sacred nature that uh, Porfirio was talking about, the spirituality as well. Uh, so we'd, we'd look at um, uh, pieces of uh, poetry and blend that with art and music and then share that with the community and see what what are the pieces, uh, where are the areas that we have overlap, what do we have in common? And then we go back, uh, we also have courses um, beginning uh, the before the conquest uh, of the New World, and we go back and talk about uh, how the indigenous tribes presented their um, society, how how they migrated from one area to another, and then how that is so important um, today. We were talking about um, environmental justice uh, recently in class, and the idea that uh, the borders um, that we see sometimes from the United States do not exist for a lot of other cultures. So this, it, it's an open, as Gloria Ansaldúa talks about borderlands, it's an open feeling uh, of um, sharing and uh, moving from one area to the other. And I will just add one more point about uh, the borders that uh, I think make it very complex and people don't think about. When we talk about building walls uh, between one country and another, not only does that affect migration of humans, and we've had students that have migrated from Central America and Mexico um, across the Rio Grande, uh, Rio Grande, uh, uh, so they come across, um, but the animals and the insects that Porfirio uh, has been uh, relating uh, stories about and how important they are to the production of art and culture, that is something that is truncated um, and is complicated by the walls. Um, and by these borders. So what we attempt to do um, is not to impose our culture on other people, uh, but to respect other uh, perspectives, to respect other indigenous tribes, and um, have that brought back to uh, the way we interpret art, the way we interpret music, the way we interpret literature in particular. Thank you. Uh, in my case, uh, I was raised in Venezuela, uh, and my father did the first contact uh, with the indigenous group in between Venezuela and Colombia. They're known as the Bari, uh, and he took me there since I was five years old, so I actually grew up with the Bari. And uh, when I was in high school, I remember uh, when one of my professors. I was second grade at the university, I did bachillerato. It's like a before three years graduation. Uh, one of my professors, an ex-priest, Pedro Chacón, was giving a teaching course on history, and he mentioned that Indian people are all gone. So I raised my hand, I said, that's not true. <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> since then I got interested in anthropology. Like, my father was a geographer, but he became pushed to anthropology, so he's a cultural geographer. And I decided to enlist uh, to the program of anthropology at the Long Universidad Central de Venezuela. Uh, and I was really interested in about social justice. Uh, because I was wondering why the indigenous peoples that live in the cities are so depressed, they drink, uh, and they're so, uh, it's like they commit suicide, suicide is very high, these people were converted. Um, and um, that moved me to the city. Although I left Venezuela when I was uh, 23 and I went to UC Berkeley uh, because I was interested in ethnicology. And Brian Berlin, my, my mentor there, my advisor, uh, he was an expert working in Chiapas uh, on uh, ethnobotany. He, he's there also an ethnobiologist studying in Peru. Uh, so I was interested in learning more about this uh, and the perception. Uh, and through the years, well, I took a lot of courses uh, about this issue in Berkeley from Hispanic studies, mm -hmm. like with Jose Duran, who taught uh, the uh, Indian agriculture, but in this architecture of Latin America, uh, and so on. 
Uh, I was also interested in discrimination, so I took a course with uh, Ronald Takaki, uh, who's a sociologist from uh, Hawaii, and he, took, uh, he talked about the uh, slave in relations to Europeans, both uh, in South Africa and Brazil, uh, was, as well as the US. It was very interesting, eye-opening. So uh, through the years teaching here in Connecticut, uh, <clears throat> I wasn't the type of anthropologist that liked to knock on doors and these people uh, invite yourself, right? So I waited for them to contact me. And through the years, I've been learning uh, the skill of making baskets, uh, making bosoneros, my expertise, which I learned from the Bay Indians, mm. as well as these people. Uh, and uh, many different things, like making handles, spoons, uh, handles of axes, uh, even uh, paddles. In fact, uh, in 2006, the medicine man of the, no, the keeper of the fire of the Mohegan, who is one in charge of the, uh, uh, the sweat lodge, uh, um, um, two bears is his name, Richard Strickland, this is his European name. Uh, he asked me if I would want to work and teach the Mohegans how to make balls and offer workshops. And my restaurant improved. And then in 2004, the director of the Bachelor de Pico Museum had a manuscript. And he was not an ethnobotanist, but he had information about many medicinal plants and all the plants uses. So he gave me the manuscript and started working on this since 2015. Right now, we have about 219 species of plants used by local tribes. Mm -hmm. uh, and based on 182 documents, mostly historical, going back to the colonial time, as well as uh, looking at museum collections. Um, photograph, uh, remnants of gardens were used uh, in the early 1900s. Because you can still see a lot of the plants, these plants, there. I had a student uh, that did a master botany with me, and he studied eight different gardens in the Mashantaki Pico Observation. So, this long relationships, uh, and in fact, uh, in the last, let's see, 2016, in the last year, no, two years ago, uh, organized in the Indian People's Day uh, in Connecticut. So we have members of the tribe. In fact, last month we have about 20 members of the tribe, mostly of East Piqua, some one Mashantuck Piqua, uh, several Mohegans, and including also uh, Wapanoan, who was my student. Uh, it was a very powerful event. Also, uh, sorry, it's a long story, but uh, this is how uh, I was uh, not indoctrinated, right? <laughs> but I learned. Uh, uh, be part of one. I'm really part indigenous because my grandmother in Malden, Venezuela is Tumanagoto, and my my father's mother's father is from Pura, Peru. So it's, it's also Quechua. So, but one last thing: when I was uh, I came from Java, so it's very interesting. Uh, uh, and this was uh, in uh, August uh, of 2016. The director museum asked if I would help uh, the local tribes to do a canoe and especially make a paddle. So, well, he gave me five days after to build to make seven paddles. So, luckily, I had knowledge of Venezuelan Indians' paddles, and my father had a collection. So, and then I started doing research for half a day until deciding models. So, I did a seven paddles, but by Friday afternoon, I was exhausted because I'm working from you know, sunrise to to night time, and. To my surprise, when they deliver the paddles to the local tribes, I was invited to paddle with them. So, in long, let's see, let's <laughs> summarize, I'll learn a lot from them, uh, from many experiences, uh, not personally, but also hearing and reading. Uh, and in fact, the last thing, I'm working on a book that's called uh, virtual social in in injustice in the Americas. When we talk America is a country, when we say Americas <coughs> is a whole continent. Uh, and for example, if you consume a banana from Guatemala, you're consuming 27 gallons of water, which you're not paying. And you're not, also, if you buy a banana that is not fair trade, uh, or is not organic, like chiquitas and doltos. A third of the money is used to uh, spray Roundup in those plantations. 
and that has caused cancers, uh, infertility. Uh, people are dying in the forties. Uh, it's just very sad. Uh, not only in Guatemala, but also in Nicaragua. And sorry. Imagine all the silver was extracted from Bolivia to Cerro Rico. Uh, you could build a bridge, a silver bridge, from La Paz all the way to Madrid. So my question is, why indigenous peoples are so poor, there's power in losing the culture? It is not because they are lazy, but because we stole their resources and we put them in a very difficult situation through racism, colonialism, and so on. And even today, we still have institutional racism. So we need to fight for that. Everyone has it, even myself. So you have to be very conscious in trying to avoid verbal aggressions as well as intellectual aggressions. I am a Colombian Indian. I was born in Colombia, South America. I immigrated to the United States 22 years ago. My family came here um, to Clinton, Connecticut. Back then, 22 years ago, I think we were in, I think in my hand, that we would fit the amount of Latino or Hispanic families that were in that area. So when I came here, um, part of my immigration or my immigrant experience shaped who I am today. And I, um, I say this in a positive way. I was um, very fortunate to grow up in a household where my language was preserved, where a lot of our culture and traditions were preserved. I grew up eating the food, listening to the music, and um, sharing the values that are part of my Colombian heritage or culture. But I also, assimilated the American culture. I took the best thing of this culture. It was a lot of richness in it too. Now, what brought me to the Hispanic Alliance was precisely that experience and the opportunity to share this and promote this within our youth and our local Hispanic communities. Sharing our heritage with everyone else, showing the richness in our culture and traditions, in our values. And we do this through programs that develop and promote education, scholarships. We do this through the arts and the culture. Our arts and culture program provide, we, we have two programs that are, one is called Imagine Public Arts. And last year, we had a great exhibition by listening. Uh, everyone here today, I, I still, you know, I. I I'm more aware of the importance of sharing our traditional arts, promoting our traditional arts. We had a wonderful artist, her name is Margarita Madison, come in. And she shared her, um, the Maya calendar, the Maya calendar. And after exhibiting in our, in our space, we have a beautiful gallery on State Street, you're all welcome to visit. And it followed with a workshop to our local community. We have youth come in. And I saw the excitement in a lot of these young girls and young men and just community um, when learning about our heritage, where we come from. Building identity, understanding where we come from, understanding our history makes us stronger today. It will allow us, art is, is, is really history and it's definitely a, a, a channel for change. It allows us through traditional arts and through arts we can promote change, we can encourage growth and change. This is really only done when we understand our history. So that is really the mission of the Hispanic Alliance is to promote our community and to make them a part of it, contributing, to contribute to our local community at larger. Emphasize the diversity. I think um, yes. a lot of people have a, a particular idea in mind when they um, uh, when they think of Latinos, yes. right? Uh, so uh, whether 
they're associating everyone from Mexico, right? Uh, that everyone eats tacos or everybody wears clothes uh, that uh, look a particular way, certain colors or whatever. And they put them all in the same uh, image of the same bag, right? And it's not that way at all. There is so much diversity within the same country, hundreds of languages. In Guatemala, they speak uh, over 350 indigenous languages. And as, as you know, this is the decade um, associated by the United Nations, the decade of indigenous languages. So there are um, over, um, the, the, the concern is that every year we're losing more and more indigenous languages. Why? Because students are being forced to learn either the, the uh, language Spanish um, in, in the schools and they don't want to learn in, uh, the indigenous language or simply that the older people are, are not teaching it to the younger people and it's, it's just, um, uh, some of them are oral languages, oral traditions. The cultures are not uh, written so that uh, uh, they can be saved through books and so forth. So what they're doing now is to uh, going back and um, uh, applying for grants. M many people, uh, and, and this is done locally as well, <coughs> recuperating that language that was lost many years ago. Uh, just as the Mohegans are doing that uh, down the road from us here, they're doing that in many parts of Latin America too. Um, and the one recent example that I think was so powerful is the Chilean uh, example. It's the first time that the indigenous tribes of Chile were invited to sit in at, at the table and work on the new constitution uh, with the new president uh, and his uh, cabinet. So I think that's a very powerful move forward. They were not as happy with the outcome because a lot of their suggestions were not uh, immediately taken, uh, but uh, it's a step forward. Uh, and and uh, I think that's a, a valuable example that a lot of the other countries are, are taking up as well. But the languages that we're losing, uh, you know, there are 42 million indigenous people living in Latin America alone in the Caribbean, 800 communities, 500 indigenous languages are spoken but one out of five indigenous populations have lost their native language. So that's huge. Um, and um, what's at risk? What are we losing? We're losing all of that <coughs> cultural richness right? and uh, that ability to communicate in your, in your native tongue. Right? And, and you, many of the, the people are uh, bilingual, trilingual, uh, but but not to lose the indigenous language is, is extremely important. Yeah, I want to add something because I work with the Paris and it was interesting all their knowledge and now knowledge vary from people. And one thing I noticed very quickly in my research because I interviewed uh, 13 people, seven women and, and women, uh, and I discovered those who had more formal education lost more knowledge. Because I interviewed, I took them to the, the forest and uh, I had a 39 different forest plots were 30 by 50 meters, some containing a 100, 250 species of trees. And I noticed that the young ones who did um, all through high school knew about 20% of the knowledge of the ancestors. Those who did a prime school knew about 47%. Uh, so knowledge has been lost. In fact, I work in the DD map of South America and the English people. And there is uh, 576 languages. And uh, in a conference in, in 1999, uh, I, I did a study the, the populations uh, in relation to, to language and, and uh, sustainability of knowledge. And uh, about 60% of the populations are under 1,000 people, which means that language and knowledge is not going to be sustainable, it's going to be lost. Uh, in, in, in the Americas, it's about, well, in South America, uh, in Peru, it's uh, about uh, 50 million quechuas, uh, for example. So the population is pretty large, uh, and then the Aymaras is a million and a half, the Mapudungus almost a million in Chile, which are the one that uh, Julio was talking. Uh, in North America, there's, in the U.S., there's about 250 different languages, so, and, uh, but they're being lost. In fact, 
the last Mohegan speaker died in 1913. Uh, and the Mohegan have been trying and working on recovering their knowledge so, and uh, teaching them. In fact, the book I'm working on about the Ocean Plan is titled uh, uh, Recovering and Repetration of Local Knowledge, the Ethnobotans of New England. Uh, so it's a collaboration between Indian peoples and us, uh, and I treat my Indian people like colleagues, not like informants. Uh, it's not like CIA has the informants, right? So, <laughs> no, we are working with experts that have a doctorate degree on their knowledge, on an informal education. So, it's, so it, the, the, to speak language is a vehicle to contain a whole the uh, culture. Because each language has different concepts. Like for example, the Baristo say bye-bye, say I'm leaving, bye -bye. And when you arrive, you don't say anything, you silence and wait uh, for the headman to invite you to the longhouse. So there's different protocols in cultures. Like for example, and these people in, in Peru, where I did work, they have only one word for medicine and for poison. Kepigare, which means that, well, of course, any medicine, if you take it in excess, is going to kill it, right? So it's a dosage. <clears throat> I better stop here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I wanted Porfirio to, to comment a little bit about um, the issues that you addressed about the environment, right, and environmental justice, uh, how are you combining that in your work, environmental and social justice through your work? Um, I think the best way, or at least for me, the best way to do it is to be mindful about the materials I'm working with, which is something that's alive, to not over-exploit them. So I do nearly every day get an email say, can you dye my garment? I'm a fashion designer, I'm, you know, I'm, I care about the environment. But so much of it is greenwashing, right? So um, it's coming from my integrity and being mindful about the information I hold or the information that runs through me, it is in my DNA. My ancestor imagined and wished this, for me to be sitting here today. So in a way that I am actually living part of their life, that means I'm representing them. So I have to be mindful about all those things. I also need to be mindful about my children, that they're the next generation. And so working for something that's alive, like a plant, can, it's not a commodity. You know, I cannot make, you know, you know, 10 or one dozen of the same design next month. Um, so it is really being mindful about that, um, respectful to the material, to the knowledge, and uh, be able to communicate that from that perspective. I hope that it, that does open up um, the point of view when it comes to nature, because when we also think about, we think about organic, that is an expensive label we think about sustainability, but what is sustainability? You, are, you know, you, you ask about, you know, all these, you know, big words. And as an indigenous person, you sometimes you look at it and you're laughing. Like, we don't even, I didn't even, we don't even have the term for organic to begin with. When I learned about organic, I said, what's organic? <laughs> well, that's the means, you know. So it is part of that being mindful about those things. It come, it's coming from a spiritual understanding is coming from this value, this integrity. But don't also expect that for all indigenous people. This is just me being crazy. <laughs> well, just uh, let me continue and add more, more detail about what uh, you say. Uh, for example, the Mohegans, when they are harvesting maize plant, they never harvest the first one. Uh, because you harvest the first one, could be the last one. So also harvest the second or third one. So this plant, in that way the harvest them is sustainable. And that's a common practice among all Indian peoples. If you think about the Cree Indian peoples, there's a, a biologist in the 70s studied the Cree Indian peoples about how fish, the fisheries. Well, he had a very little uh, uh, brand, so uh, he couldn't study the fisheries, the European fisheries, so he worked with Indian peoples. And he discovered that the Cree were all fishing the Europeans and yet maintaining the stock. 
because they have respect to nature, uh, they are careful of stopping. They have areas they cannot hunt because the no population is increasing. So they, they really uh, are very conscious about their impact on the environment. So to be sustainable is, is part of the country. Yeah, you have a question. First here, uh, uh, I'm sorry. I, I agree with everything you said. You're running into an open door with me as far as nature and not consuming too much and using natural materials and so on. But you're, um, and I think it's great if you have indigenous heritage that you know about, but a lot of Americans don't even know their heritage, you know, because people jump ship in here, whatever. Um, they live here now, and the consumer culture is their heritage. That's what they get born into. <coughs> That's what is home to them. Yeah. And you know, that it's a bankrupt culture or that it's a completely destructive culture is not in a way their fault. They get born into it. And you know, as any of us a parent or a grandparent, you say, Well, dang, you know, all this bad stuff happening, I should have done something when I was seventeen, or I should have done it when I was thirty, or when I was forty five, I didn't do it. And you know, <coughs> how do you stop a moving tanker? Yeah. I mean, the, the tank of capitalism and what that demands in consumption of what people expect of their lifestyles. We, we fight this all the time locally, development and so on, but it's, you know, it's completely heartbreaking. Yeah, well, I, I, mean, uh, I teach environmental technology and we talk about this. In fact, I discovered extremely that I'm not as a consumer of most people. In fact, my daughter and me, we make presents to each other. We don't consume. And I've been learning when you're making things, you're more conscious about the art of the community. In fact, your eye is trained to see not only the color, the sign, but also the thickness of the threads. You are you are not the problem in the presence <laughs> you buy. No, no, no. But, but mean, like it, a broader swath of people, oh. what they expect and what they do, the people who push consumption forward on a grand scale, they are the ones who somehow don't need to be talked down to or like feel like they're being overeducated or something. They they are the ones who are driving this consumption. Um, if I may add, um, there is a national organization called um, the Hispanic Federation. And what they do is I believe it's the Hispanic Federation. They work um, they promote eco change and they do this through the working with youth. What they do is um, they educate and create awareness, develop awareness of the relationship between us and Earth, right? We are not isolated from this planet. We need this planet. We are part of this planet. And they run programs, educational programs, that encourage these young individuals to work with water programs and, and develop the programs themselves. So I think that sometimes we want to solve a problem at a larger scale, saying, well, let's make a change, a big change. Maybe we could just start with our youth and inspiring them and showing them that beautiful relationship we have with Mother Nature, with botanicals, how we can use so many different herbs to, to feel better, right? Um, it's just, it, there's so many ways to do it, beginning with using flowers to make art, and you know, the, there's so many things. So I think that's where we can begin, right? Um, with the kids and, and teaching them and showing them, well, this is where we come from. We all, you're right, I, I have the same feeling, even though I come from Colombia, from South America, but when you ask me, where do I come from, or what am I? I am a mix, I am a, I am a mix of different races. A, melt. a melting pot of European, white, of, of indigenous, of um, African. I have a little bit of everything. I could be a mestizo, I, could be, I haven't looked into that. But what I do know is that where I come from is from Earth. From, that, that is the connection that we all have in common. Yeah. And there's no question about that. You know, it's, it's interesting. Okay. Sorry. Um, you know, I'm just going to add that the consumer culture, it didn't start in the United States, first of all. I mean, we're, we're going back to the colonial period 
in Latin America, those ships, that was globalization, those ships were going from Mexico laden with cochinillo, but, but also with silver, uh, right, and taken back to Spain, to Sevilla, and that's where everything was recorded. And if you go there now, you can look at the archive of the Indies, and you'll see the list of what was taken out of the New World, right? It's, it's, um, it's uh, just impressive to, to see that, that quantity of goods. Um, and then it was transferred from there to the rest of, uh, of the world. So it went uh, as far as the Philippines, it went to India and so forth, and it was sold on that. Then the British got involved and decided that, well, they didn't have to do the work of pulling it out of the ground. They would just uh, attack the ships that, uh, that the Spanish were sending across the water uh, and, uh, and, and found their treasure that way. But those empires, that um, uh, uh, concept of consumerism uh, w was being pushed from the, from, uh, the exchange from the beginning. Uh, the gold was there, uh, and uh, there are many engineers who say that uh, the gold was in, in, uh, in Peru, it was in um, Mexico. But they had, they made they calculated how complicated it was going to be for them to pull it out and decided well silver was easier to get so they pulled that out and, and shipped that at that time. Uh, so a, a lot of this is, is not um, it, it's not new and it goes back even before in, in, in the centuries um, you know, with the Chinese civilization and so forth. But what I think we have to bear in mind too is that. Uh, most recently, with uh, we have an opportunity. Um, we have an opportunity with the with the young people, but also because of what was forced on us with COVID, to take a step back and start to think about how valuable is this, right? How important is it for me to be purchasing this at this particular time, and uh, how important is it rather than to share um, and understand what other cultures are doing. Uh, so that's what we're trying to encourage in the younger uh, generation <coughs> and the young people uh, that you don't have to travel all over the world. Right? You can make connections with people other ways. Um, flying, you know, it saves the environment. If you're not, your carbon footprint, if you're not taking that extra flight. Um, and, uh, and think about these things as we're doing it. So I think. Um, Going back to the way we train our children um, uh, and, and um, preserve the world for our children, we have to model that. You know, it's not lecturing them. Right? If you're not modeling that for your own children uh, or for your students, I know a lot of you are teachers here too today. Uh, I think it's it's extremely important that they um, that they see that and it's a value uh, and that we're sharing it with them. Can I have one more thing? Yeah. Well, I have two, two. Okay. No, I was going to two more points because it was a question, which is excellent. I like it. Um, um, one thing you can do is start having a garden, consuming foods. I so I make my own sauerkraut, my wine, my beer. I make my, all my furniture, my tables uh, in the house. I make baskets, uh, leather projects. My purpose is making most arrows. Uh, so I collect mushrooms, uh, I go bow hunting, get all my meats, I got 60 years this year, and then I go spear fishing, I make my own spears, and I got about 45 that uh, this summer. So I'm storage and all that. Uh, so my impact environment is very little. It's a book I gave to my students to read, it's called No Impact Man by uh, Colin Beeman. And he spent one year trying to avoid, uh, to have an impact environment by buying local, no use elevator, metro, or, or, or bus, walk or use a bicycle, and so on. No use of toilet paper, no use of hot water, uh, no use of refrigeration, and so on. So it's fascinating to read. My students are, are really uh, learning about the importance of having a to the environment. I talk about this issue, I've been talking to you in different courses, and that's how I, I learn myself uh, to see it with a different lens. Uh, but going back to what Prophet mentioned about the corn, for example, in Indipos develop uh, about a thousand varieties of corn. Like for example, potatoes, there's uh, 
This will be 5,000 varieties of potatoes in Peru. Now there's only 2,100 left. In Mexico, it's happening the same thing. I read a paper recently that discovered that a lot of the maize that they cultivate corn is being infected by Monsanto corn. And Monsanto corn costs half the price to sell it than the native corn. So no wonder a lot of Indian people migrate to here. Because first of all, they're not making the living. Uh, uh, and second of all, Monsanto is suing them for growing their corn, mm -hmm. which originally come from Mexico. So it's ridiculous, it, but it's a reality <coughs> that we need to be aware. So the most important thing you can do is inform yourself and share this knowledge to the next generation. So, like, I, I told my daughter, she buys the work, she has a fantastic garden, she saves all the food for the year, runs herbs, uh, she makes her wine and beer too, she tweet, uh, uh, weave. In fact, she makes beautiful uh, cotton and uh, wool things, like a tray with wood things, so, or uh, jerky, when it's a jerky, or dulce leche, or so on. So you have to learn to start making things little by little. And that way, you're reducing the impact to the environment. For example, I only drive 3,000 miles in my truck. I have a truck that has four cylinders, so it consumes very little. And in fact, the a guy in the store uh, that changed my tires said, well, you drive like a grandmother. So <laughs> in fact, my tire lasted eight years. Recently, it lasted longer. It's because they're cracking it, <laughs> so, for example. So we consume less and consume high quality. Consume what is not a fair trade. Like it's a fair trade store in, in the London. And consume what you need to produce or local people produce. So even though it costs more money, like for example, these rocks are $800. But the amount of labor that he puts is giving a, a, a very a reduced price that is not uh, a wealthy living or even the salary of the I'm sorry, I'm going to stop here. Next question. Thank you. Uh, Porfirio, it's such a, an honor to have uh, such a fine artist here to uh, talk with us. And I am very interested in hearing how your personal journey to open and deepen your dream time, as you said, your creative imagination, how that has affected um, your uh, process in design. And then secondly, when you actually sit to weave or create, do you have a certain ritual that you bring to that um, as part of your creative process? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, you have to, unfortunately, in order to, um, to be able to, in, in my case, to do the kind of work and having a much more wider understanding uh, I have to, uh, I've been losing a lot to gain more by migrating, by leaving a much more um, urban America. But to me, I, my work could not, could have not existed the way it is now if I would have not migrated. This is important. So uh, my mom said, my mother says that She's a healer because the greater being has blessed her hands to do the work she does and give her the knowledge to the plants. When I went back to the community resuming my art practice, she said, you're here because greater being has blessed your hands to do the work you do. So I'm driven by that. I didn't discover, it's not a passion, and I didn't discover it. It discovered me. I just had to listen to it. So um, by being here, seeing, meeting all of you and uh, you know all of you with tremendous knowledge that also enable that also um, enriches my knowledge that um, helps to have a much more wider understanding and um, to be able to communicate to the world um, when I see it as an artist and create something so much of it it is done by conversation and experiences that I have gone through and countless um, and give you an example. My very fear first um, shows I had, I used to show my work at a street fair around California, you know, it, you know that's how I started. Um, and um, I remember I had a show in uh, San Diego uh, where they invite many other artists from Mexico 
and there was these, uh, an American lady that was exporting rugs from my same village that was also selling there. So I got invited as an artist to go and sell my work there. And uh, when I show up, they treat me like cockroach because she had a, such a big influence on them. And she told them, if he comes back the next time, I'm not going to come anymore. I'm gonna pull all my stuff from this gallery because I'm contributing so much to this gallery and here you are, you inviting an artist to compete with me. I've had those kind of experiences throughout. At first, I didn't know how to deal with them. But with time, I said, if I'm guided by the spirits of my ancestors and the greater being, I shouldn't have to fight against them. I can only start educating and talking about it. And not to raise an empathy. Instead, this is my reality. So, so much of my conceptual work started by my experiences and started by a dialogue and let it flow and let, 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 let it live and how it's going to live. Um, continue to go back to the materials and integrity of the work and, and you know, where this work started and how it started and to flow and so that way it can hopefully communicate to the world. Um, I have been blessed to more recent years started to show my work in a much more contemporary art world and settings. Um, that's new to me because I'm indigenous, because I'm also categorized as you know a much more lower class artwork. So little by little, you know, having here and having my pieces in the collection here or at the Smithsonian, or having a solo show at the uh, uh, the Bay last month, that has been able me to share this kind of conversation. And uh, more than anything, at the end of the day, to me, it is. We're all in this, with your support, my tradition, it's alive. I'm hoping I'm sharing some value to the world. And that's how I think this kind of tradition is continuing to be preserved. But that's really how my work get flows. I don't particularly, when I meditate about something, it's, um, I don't sit in a corner. It just comes to me. It just it lives within my DNA. It just flows. And it finds its way into the works and uh, sometimes the work it's the conceptual and what I'm the message that's really the piece of work sometimes and, and the second part of that question was when he's actually sitting at the room and weaving what is your inspiration in and do you have any ritual around that how do you call in your uh, you know creative guides <laughs> yeah, that, that's always uh, an interesting thing. I um, I don't dance around. I don't do anything like that. I like to burn copal. I'm trying to pull myself from the busy life. Um, I my mentally I get ill um, sitting in the computer, but it's also a blessing because it has forced me to learn to communicate to write. I've noticed I spend a lot of time now the last few years writing and trying to communicate. So I try to pull myself away from that because to me, it's a ritual that started when I was born. I'm leaving this ceremony and ritual and trying to pull my way from um, commercialization of textiles and trying to give myself the freedom of creating. That is a ceremony. And when you create work within that process, it is not a product anymore. It really, to me, it is a ceremony, it is a prayer piece. Because it now it's living freely. It's not detached to anything. Or I'm sorry, it's not attached to just a commodity. Right? And and then we're going to find the energy and the people that are going to support it because that's it's meant to be that way. Um, when I sit down I try to always uh, burn copal because copal brings a lot of peace to me and to my environment and that's something that is being used in my culture for different ceremonies, uh, always. So it is more than just the ritual itself, it's a state of mind. Yeah, uh, so um, I'll speak from experience and then ask a question, I guess. So having grown up in this area as uh, of Pequot descent and colonizer descent, including the Allens, who's sort of mausoleum of the we're sitting in, um, you know, there was always, there was a dialogue in our household, and 
the understanding was that the the heritage of being indigenous was had to do with alcohol abuse and transgenerational trauma, and so that was just that was those were things that were not spoken about, right? And it was there were family members who uh, physically appeared more indigenous that there was a disconnect from, and it was I, I was taught this as a teenager when I started asking questions that like you know this was there was a conscious separation from that identity being made because it was sort of for my own good as a the idea of passing essentially in America that if you can look white you're better off not to be the other thing right and so I guess my question would be and this is a sort of an identity negotiation is what does it mean to be indigenous in the modern world great question I, I guess that's for me I don't, <laughs> what does it mean to be an indigenous you know um, when I think about my work and my journey and what I'm here to do, uh, it took me a long time to be able to listen to that and to bring my state of mind to, so I could be mindful and listen to all these things. And um, I used to, when I arrived here, I used to want to look different um, because of the oppression in Mexico. I didn't, and well, I was embarrassed to say that I'm Oaxacan and I was also indigenous. Um, and, um, but uh, being indigenous is being me, is being you that if you're indigenous or you're African, whatever color, size, you're you. you. You know, it's in your genes, it's in your DNA. You can't change that, you can't. So for me as indigenous person, art has healed me and uh, helped me to understand who I am, what's my identity, my role, time and history, and I'm trying to be me. Uh, I like to read as much as I can so I can communicate to a level of you know, to, to be able to communicate. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm also just learning, and but I'm being me, right? And um, that's really who I am. I'm being me. I, um, you know, I use a car, I travel, I uh, speak English, and next week I'm going to Oaxaca. My parents don't speak Spanish. We speak Zapotec. Um, we live in a, such a traditional way of life. I eat sitting on the ground, but I could fly to uh, uh, China the next day and, uh, and live that as well. Um, just, I just want to be me. I really have to check, am I living with the integrity of who I am? And that's just being me. And, yeah, yeah and, I, and I also would like to add, I mean, uh, we're all discussing uh, decolonization. Right? And, and how we approach that. And what that really means is a lot of the history and the stories that we were not privy to uh, when we were in school, uh, not in our history books, now we have to talk about it. And we are talking about it, and it's going to hurt. It does hurt. It hurts everyone, right? Um, not one, we're not oppressing one group uh, in particular. But it's the idea of bringing out then um, that past and moving beyond that, that concept that indigenous, uh, yes, they were suffering when they went to school. They were small children were taken from their families and put in school hundreds of miles away. They were not allowed to speak their own language. They were not allowed to see their parents uh, and so forth. And they were abused by the teachers and the leaders there. Uh, so all of that needs to come out because that's been pushed down for, for generations. And uh, so many national target uh, peacocks will say, uh, kids in school with me in Ledger would say, you're not, you're not national target. You don't look national target. You know, you're just trying to get the money so that you can um, have a different lifestyle. And it's just. Uh, all of these things need to come out into conversation. And, and that, 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 yes, there was alcoholism, there is alcoholism. These are major problems. But how do we deal with it as a society um, in, instead of pushing them off uh, onto reservations and saying that you'll take care of your own there? It's, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really important question. Uh, and uh, the opposite end of that is the passing that you're talking about. American and not, not look indigenous. Yeah, I, I, well, I a, the, 
Uh, no, I want to answer your question and add more. Um, being indigenous, like our anthropologists, ethnologists, and herbologists, is someone who practice their traditional ancestors, uh, who speak the language, practice the culture, live in the environment, traditional environments, uh, and or there's in the case of Piqua, they recognize everyone who has a gene, or ancestors Piqua. For example, uh, Navajo, you have to have both parents to speak the language to be able to recognize. In the case of Bari, you have to be full blood Bari in Venezuela. They don't accept the half breeds, but they're afraid that the other half will come to the territory and mix them up. Uh, so they want to maintain the language. And language is a culture. Uh, in your case, you suffer a massacre, a terrible massacre in 1637, and almost yeah. all the a people were, yeah, all the people were killed, their land was taken, and they're given the worst piece of land, which is only a fraction of the original territory. So. Uh, and so, it, and then they have to work not only to produce their own food, they sell their products like their baskets to survive. And women will carry a heavy load of baskets, paintings, uh, to be able to make the living. Their husband has to go to the whalers, uh, and their mortality was very high. So, they pay the they, the cost they pay for a survival is very high. So, I, I'm proud of you. There was one more question in the back. Um, well, I had a question, a follow-up on the um, on the uh, the way that you sit down to create, uh, you know, your work. It, it applies to all of you, okay? Not just let's, let's not go down one path. Here. My experience is that I was hoping to hear, and I heard something that you actually change as you go through this process of year after year, and then you mature and, and see a different way of looking at it. And I heard some of that, you know, you, like you, you wanted to write more, or you, but I didn't, I didn't hear that I was using my experience necessarily in a, in a better way. That was my follow-up question. And that, that goes to all of you, by the way, because you all have a creative aspect. Most, a lot of people in the room do too. So uh, we're, we're all trying to uh, you know, do what we can with, our, with the way we, we live and the best we can do, put a garden in our, in our backyard. I'd like to do that better and better each year. Not you know, like put, put butterfly bushes in and things like that, because I'm learning, right? So I was just hoping to hear more along those lines. That yeah, what I would say, um, from, and I'm going to give him some time to think about his answer. <laughs> uh, what, what I would say from my point of view is I started a lot of my research working on Orientalism, and I, I love the uh, picture of the um, weaving that has the influence from the Moors in Spain. Uh, so uh, Orientalism starting in Spain with the influence of the, the, the Jewish culture and the Moorish culture um, and, the, and the Christian all blending together, uh, that, that uh, coexistence of cultures. So, so one point on that, I was researching this this morning with my wife and my daughter, and I might have got it wrong, but this antagonism that this discussion has been about the civilization in the Americas. It did exist in Spain. At one point, the Jews hailed the Moors for coming into Spain. They, did I get it right? They liberated the Jewish people. Okay. So, uh, right, and then the, uh, they were expelled in 1492, and then the, right. then the Moors were forced to convert to Christianity as well. So there's a, uh, it, but there's a, and there's a lot of blendings there. Right? There's yeah. a lot of fusion of cultures. Um, and, and also when I look at the pictures of uh, your hands and the dye, the blue dye for, in particular, um, and the vats of dye that you work with, it reminds me of the dyes in, in Morocco and Fez, right? The big vats and how they would dye the leather there. And it depends uh, on the geography. Uh, a lot, right? Uh, being from Oaxaca, being in the mountains, uh, you have certain colors that you're using. 
Um, the same thing in Peru and Bolivia. If you're in the mountains as opposed to the um, more tropical areas, you're using different colors and dressing differently and so forth. So I, I think all of these uh, experiences influence, your experience brings together, yeah. right? Uh, and, you, and that matures. That so you saw that, years. you saw those things in nature, you brought them to way, the way you think you ought, you ought to be. You know, and you know, you've you grown with that, right, uh, over the years. You, that you grow with that experience. Yeah. In my experience, um, it is um, creating work and revitalizing this natural vibe in my career. And uh, creating work that it's shared with the world and everybody that would want to support it or even some people take some of my workshops. So it's really sharing a lot of the knowledge and understanding and a lot of what we're talking about here becomes very tangible, whether through the pieces or my workshops. And so when I think about my work, I think about migration in United States or, you know, or in Southern California where I live. It is really to celebrate us who wants to be part of this app, who is interested in, you know, you guys showed up here, that's great. I appreciate that, that is part of coming together. That's part of celebrating, right? Um, conversation. It's conversation, it's great. Um, my kids, my wife's uh, parents um, are from Jalisco, where much of um, the people there are Europeans. Or, or descendants Europeans. So my wife was born and raised in Southern California. So my kids are not pure Zapotec, right? So I'm the first that wants to celebrate diversity and coming together, right? But when I think about that, in our culture, there isn't a name that's indigenous. There isn't a name that's black, you're a black person, and you're white. There isn't a name in our language we're human. We're just human, right? And I think about that because that's how I think and I hope through my work I celebrate human. You're also seeing the, the world in a larger, uh, you know, portrait. You've, you, you've endorsed the, the continuous line, you know, way, looking, at, looking at art, okay? Not, not everyone can, can understands that necessarily, but you are trying to develop in other areas for yourself, I think, when you, when you look at things like that. Yeah, and there was a, the former president uh, years ago in Mexico, of course for you, Diaz, uh, who said, uh, for Mexico, right, so far from God and so close to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, can I, are, are all of the colors you've utilized in your rugs natural? Because I see an enormous variety of color. Absolutely. So there I have been. Thank you for for that question. Because I'm, I'm afraid that um, I'm not giving hope in our conversation here. I want to celebrate. <laughs> and I want to be able to come back to that. And um, the colors, um, out of around 10 to 1 dozen elements, I have been able to create 200 different colors from um, all nature. Uh, this is within the effort of the studio. Within, we have been able to create that within about five or six years, from starting from the very basic knowledge uh, that was my parents kept, um, and resuming this almost near to, from zero. Have been able to create a couple of different, and in fact, I have some samples there when, well, if you hope you stick around, we'd love to, you guys come up, show more, show more of the pieces, but also show you some other samples of the materials. When I, when I was young, I lived in Mexico for four years. And uh, since I returned here, I've made, it, I've made an effort to go to yard sales and buy early Mexican textiles mm -hmm. that are at least 60, 80, or 100 years old. And I also have some early ceramics from very early tourists. I'd like to be able to send you pictures of them to give you some idea of, of whether or not they use you, they used the types of dyes. Absolutely, we'd love to see it. And you should have a, a recent one. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I, agree, I agree.
agree with them. <laughs> One more question, and then uh, yeah. you can hang around yeah. and ask questions. I, I was just wondering what that strong red is made from. What, yes, so um, if I just don't uh, want to just, uh, just you know, start to redirect the conversation. But um, so this particular piece here, thank you. Uh, this is uh, so this is. Three different shades of cochineal. Mm -hmm. So some of these things red. It actually has a. Uh, uh, it's an over dye with pericon. The pericon gives yellow. So in order to create some a deep red, you have to have a yellow undertone. And uh, this is all cochineal insect. It is the same understanding as the butterflies. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's it, it just uh, reinterpreted. Uh, and butterflies are, uh, this is a more traditional design. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I actually have a butterfly here, but this is a more traditional design. Mm -hmm. Something that it's known in the of a and rod, many colors and so forth. So, um, as you can see, my work is much more minimal, very minimal. Too. So, but yeah, the, all the reds. Burgundy in these beads comes from Cochinelles. So yes, we have an ancestral design. We have ancestral design. Absolutely. And then while some of you are, are your creation in the secret piece, and then also you need inspiration by the... And um, it, it, the, the piece that you have upstairs, too, is extraordinary. If you haven't seen that, please please uh, make sure you see the collection upstairs. And view that alongside, I'm going to put in a plug for the photography mm -hmm. uh, exhibit. Um, there are a lot of echoes with, with uh, mm -hmm. uh, Porfidio's work there as well. There's a, um, for, a photo of a young uh, indigenous from, um, uh, young boy from Brazil. Uh, who, they talk about the body paintings. Right? So it's the same red colors, it's the same culture. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could tell us how you get some of the other colors, if it's not a secret. Uh, it's not a secret at all. <coughs> it is how you can get them. You have to have a, you have to be an applied scientist or applied chemist to be able to understand nature. It is uh, so you're working with yashi, for example. Yashi, this is my native native word, and uh, yashi, and just like a lot of the plants uh, in nature, gives you either green or yellow, the, for the most part. Those are very common color you get in nature. And all plants gives you color, all of them. Well, the first thing you need to understand is whether that plant is actually fugitive. What, what does that mean is that the color actually changes dramatically with time, even if it's on a shade. So not all plants is color fast. And to color fast, some of these plants, there might be part of a family that's additive, meaning you need a mordant, you need a binding agent. So once you identify this, and you identify the plant that gives you the color, but it doesn't change dramatically in a short period of time, you can then start to understand how you're actually going to attach it to a fiber. Yashi, it is a plant uh, for medicine and uh, for olive greens. And in a stainless steel pot, it gives you yellow. And an iron pot, because of the iron, it turns green. Yeah, it's, it's known as mordant. Uh, you can use different types of chemicals, uh, like copper, rosin iron, and, uh, and so on. And so on. so they, they change the tones. So it's almost like yeah. alchemist, right? Yeah. You're an alchemist. <laughs> then there's a lot of it there. So there's all these understanding. And uh, Yashi, it gives me a much more deeper green here in, in Ventura than in Oaxaca. Same plant. But because where it grows, because of the environment, it gives me a much more deeper green. So that also, that understanding has to be addressed as well. So you can, if you're matching color, then you're addressing all these variations. And the walnut plant from California gives you different color than 
it, it gives, yeah, it gives slightly different, uh, many of these plants gives slightly different shades. And, and same recipe. Mm. Mm. I mean, I don't know about inspiration in people's, uh, the, uh, the queen will say that when you're making a bowl, you need to read a word. You need to follow the path. So you cannot read a good sign and violate some of the physical, natural ways of the plants. Because they are not straight and crooked, right? And they have different elements. So you have to read the, the material. It's almost like a, when Profil is working, he's just reading and, and imagining, right? And the sign. And it's very mathematical. Because look at this. So it's a lot of different numbers to really have a different location of the columns. So you have to be a mathematician to be able to do that too. A lot of mathematics when it comes to uh, geometric design. Yeah. 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 Could you talk a little bit about your rediscovery of how, just how was it trial and error? I mean, you said you had this sort of seed of knowledge, of traditional knowledge of dyes from your parents that they had preserved, and then you built on that. How did you go about doing that? What did you, was it all trial and error, just trying different things, or did you get it from another source? Um, try, yes, uh, experimenting, uh, talking to some of the elders in the community, and um, understanding what happens when you're using uh, iron, or you're using um, stainless steel, when you're using pottery, is it a fermentation? Is it so? It is um, building on. I think from my parents, what they, you know, brought to to my work is the basic knowledge. And since because really young, you were just growing up, so embedded with nature, you have a big understanding how the plants behave and what what it's going to do. You have an understanding already. And um, when uh, my first colors were all. Uh, pinks and, and light blues and uh, shirt greens and yellows, very uh, pastel color, very pastel. And uh, I still have some pictures of some of very early weeds. And then from there, I said, well, then if it's doing this, why it's not doing these other things? Why it's not? And then talking to some of the uh, uh, elders. And as, and as I was um, trying to revitalize this, I found other, um, uh, especially specifically my, my maestro in the village, that was um, has already gone and experimented a lot more, and he was the one that also shared uh, freely shared some uh, some of the, the technique, uh, specifically the use of cochineal and indigo, which was lost way many generation many generation before me. So, um, but I also um, I spent quite a bit time researching at the Smithsonian through my leadership through my uh, uh, artist leadership there. Uh, at the uh, at the Metropolitan Museum in New York at UC Berkeley, I did some research at the uh, Oaxacan uh, textiles there. More than anything, uh, I was I was looking at you know what model of plants they used, what are the colors? Because by then my eye was already trained about chemical colors and natural colors. So just trying to understand that, and the only uh, or the only the majority of things I found was cochineal indigo and a yellow source. <coughs> could have been a tree moss, because tree moss didn't need more of it. And uh, mm -hmm. so those things, those are some of the things that I found. And uh, But I also found um, some of the pieces that were done, uh, there was a piece that was done in the 1930s, was already dyed with chemicals. Mm -hmm. So I kind of <coughs> start to understand that trace, what happened historically with chemical dyes, and trying to find as much as I can with about natural dye, but never a recipe never found a recipe. And so understanding, more than anything, is understanding nature, how they live, how they behave. And that's how I started to create much more deeper uh, colors. Something you want to ask you? Sure. Um, and as I'm listening to you, and you talk about the form of, of uh, chemia, pretty much. Um, you know, sometimes when you talk, when you're cooking, when you're preparing yeah. a recipe, when you're cooking, there's a lot of a lot of um, elements that have an effect. You may know the recipe, you have, may have it, but if you emotionally, mentally, if there's you know, if are not necessarily present or there, 
the recipe doesn't necessarily work out, right? You'll find that something is not coming out the right way. Um, and I'm, as I'm listening to you and you're talking about um, being chosen, right? Is, is this part always there? Are you always prepared and ready to do this work? Or do you find moments where you're not, I and mean, then we will say today, inspired, or I mean, do you have moments where this opinion is not working, where you would have that additional element? Mm -hmm. of yeah, if you read, or if you, you guys, you know, you spend a lot of time with indigenous people, and maybe you guys have also knowledge, uh, maybe in traditional medicine and so forth, <clears throat> not every plant could be harvested, or not any plant could be harvested at any time. Mm -hmm. And not every time, <clears throat> or all the time, uh, you're going to be able to heal someone. And it's the same thing with this work. <clears throat> you know, I have to pay mortgage next week. <laughs> and, I, and I'm trying to sell you pieces. You know, it's the energy. It's definitely, you know, I know that's just a, that's just reality, sure. But you have this, you know, busy life and you know, you're dealing with all these other things. And I find that that really um, affects me a lot. And um, and I come a, a, to be a, a quite sensitive person as well. So I'm, I'm affected with, I'm, I'm overthinking a lot, in, in, in a lot of things. So it has to live free. It has to live, it has to come. Uh, Picasso said that, no todos los días soy brujo. Mm -hmm. Not every day he's a, uh, a shaman or a, a, you know, not every day, a witch, a witch, a witch or, or not every day you're like that. And many of you has, uh, or all of us has that creative spirit. But if we can listen to it, if we're sensitive enough to listen to that, and, uh, and it's living in a, such a busy environment, it's not easy at all to do that, but that's exactly how I understand my work. It's just like what my mother says, not every, not, you cannot harvest certain plant any time. There's times for everything. There's cycle of everything, when especially working with nature, and it's the same thing here, it's here, it's here. Um, to finish up with, with that is, um, when I had barely started to resume my art practice, I started working with these designers in New York. I thought I, that, was, that was it. I was like, man, you've been working with a designer in New York, that's, that's, that's it. I've learned so much and I really appreciate her. And up until now, we're good friends and we just in peace and, and the relationship. Because the energy of um, being pushed by consumerism, right? You know, there's a lead time for something. Well, the color needs to be like on the photograph we took last month. All these things, right? There's such a strong energy that you can force nature. And now you have a lead time. But you can't live as an artist with that big oppression. And um, and when you have that energy existing, I don't really care what you do, but the colors, the colors, it's never going to come out. And, and you could be doing this all your life. It's just not going to work. It's just not going to work because there's an energy there. For me, it has to <coughs> be free. And uh, and I learned that, that that's not the way that I'm supposed to be going. That I just, you know, part and, uh, yeah. yeah, to add what he said, uh, it's like um, the global tribes don't collect uh, the sap of uh, a sugar maple, except the northern side, to get a cough medicine. Or for example, harvesting the wood to make uh, the basket, the black ash, brown ash, they collect on the northern side the hill, because that way the, the rings will be stronger. Or like the uh, Cherokee in uh, Virginia, they only collect uh, the wood for the boss or hickory. Uh, on the uh, moon, no, the seven days after the full moon uh, of February, uh, in fact, local tribes don't pan corn until the dog would leave for the size of squirrel uh, ear. So, uh, <laughs> but talking about culture, culture and recipes, recipe and culture the same. They are written. There's a form to think. or is what you're supposed to do. But what you do is something else, like Porfirio. Porfirio integrates uh, a lot of information. The knowledge is 
uh, disperse. So we learn things from neighbors, and we integrate in our culture, right? So cultures evolve, and it constantly changing. The profile is probably an example of the Zapotec art uh, that you see here. So on behalf of the Lyman Allen Museum, Connecticut College, and the Hispanic Alliance, we thank you all, especially for free, for coming.